Uh, we've got a uh, special guest speaker along here today. His name is Professor Michael Douglas from Charles Darwin University. Uh, Michael is going to give us a presentation on river flows and fissures and what's the latest science in telling us about what is happening in our river systems and the, town and the potential impacts for future development. So when Michael's ready, I'll uh, hand him over to you and ask you to give him a round of applause, please. Thank you, members, for inviting me. It's a great pleasure to come and speak to you about some of the latest research that's been done around fish and fisheries across the north. And it's, a lot of it's of interest to the sorts of things that you're interested in catching out of the sea and the rivers around here. So I'm here as a um, member of Charles Darwin University, but I'm also director of TRAC, the Tropical Rivers and Coastal Knowledge and Research Hub, and director of the Northern Australian Node of the National Environmental Research Program. Um, I'm not pro-conservation, not pro-development, but I'm very interested in making sure that people have got the best available information at their fingertips so that they can make well-informed decisions about the future of the North. What I wanted to do is start off with this map of that shows the level of disturbance of rivers around Australia. And the first thing you can see here is that the North, the rivers that are blue up here, are the ones that are least disturbed. And it comes as no surprise to you to know that the best rivers, the least disturbed river systems in the country, are those ones in the northern parts. Down here around the more developed parts of the country, we've got river systems that have been heavily disturbed, heavily impacted, and to be honest, that's probably the reason why many of us live up here and enjoy living up here, because we've got such good river systems. And there's a lot of benefits that come from that. We've got internationally recognised biodiversity and conservation values with the river systems and wetlands across the north. They're incredibly important for commercial and recreational fishing, and that's why you're all here today. And so they're really important resources, and we have very high expectations about the level of health that we expect from these river systems. And that's in stark contrast to the expectations we have for those river systems that are shown in brown on that previous slide. But we also know that the areas in the north, and particularly the wet dry tropics, there's 55 river systems between the tip of Cape York across the Broome, and those 55 river systems account for about half of all of Australia's river flows. But most of that water is going straight from the top of the wet river systems out on the floodplains and then out into the sea. There's very little of that, far less than 1%, is currently diverted for other purposes. But that's probably not likely to remain that way. Previous governments have all been talking about the idea of a food bowl in northern Australia, and as recent as last Friday, uh, the Prime Minister again talked about the possibility of Northern Australia becoming a food bowl and one of the critical constraints on that at the moment is the availability of water resources. Now water resources are still seen as one of the big issues in terms of making Northern Australia a food bowl. And the history of developing water resources in Australia, in those areas that are now brown, and in fact globally, follows a predictable and pretty depressing pathway. That is that we see water resources and river systems as being limitless, lands of limitless potential. They tend to be developed, usually to go too far over development. We then end up with degraded systems that then require some sort of restoration. And the reality is that prevention is a lot cheaper than cure. And the cost of restoring river systems like the Murray-Darling Basin, for example, are in the tens of billions of dollars. So there's probably a lot to be said about making good decisions early on, rather than having to try and recover and get water back into river systems and try and restore degraded river systems later on. And that's why I think it's important to have information about this before we make the big decisions. So will we make the same mistakes that they've made in those brown river systems and we'll end up with the north going down that pathway as well? Or will we be smarter about the way we've done it? Now there's already been a lot of discussion, both the politicians who are here talked about the fact that we've got to look at growing business and growing enterprises in the north, but we've got to do it in a sustainable way. So that's, that's part of the reason why I have some optimism about the future. The other thing is that if you look at the history of development, a lot of that development in those areas that are buggered up now took place quite some time ago. And we were making decisions then in the absence of good information. So we weren't really sure about what it was that was at stake, what we could lose, and we weren't sure about the costs and the impacts that those sorts of developments like dams and so on are likely to have. And I'd say that we're in a very different situation for Northern Australia, and that's another reason why I'm optimistic. So I wanted to talk about what it is that's special about these Northern River systems, particularly what the new information tells us about them, and also what we know about some of the potential impacts. So for starters, Northern Australia is absolutely critical in terms of Australia's fish biodiversity. 
these river systems in the north, they cover about 17% of the Australian landmass, and yet they account for about more than 50% of all fish species found in Australia are found in those northern river systems. And you can see here the ones in pale green, they're the ones that have more than 30 species of freshwater fish in them. So they're really unique, they're really important, and they're really significant in terms of biodiversity. Some of the more recent research that we've been doing is over the last few years getting much finer detail understanding of where that biodiversity is, which fish species occur in which river systems, right down to which parts of river systems across the north. And this is new information which can help to underpin planning for how we develop these systems. So we now can see where the hotspots are in terms of species richness, which parts of the river systems have got the most species, but we can also see which of those river systems have the most endemic species. And endemic species are the ones that are only found in that particular river system. So if you look at the Kimberley, it may not be a hotspot in terms of numbers of species, but the fish that are found there aren't found anywhere else. So it's very important in terms of endemic species. So this is the first time that we've really had this sort of information where people can look across the north and look at the most important hotspots for biodiversity, those that are going to be most impacted by changes. The other thing is, it's not just what species are there, but it's the type of species and the types of life histories. Many of our species, as you're aware, have to move from the fresh water down to the salt water to complete their life cycles. And again, we now can go through and look at catchment by catchment, basement by basement, and look at what proportion of the fish in those river systems needs to move down to the sea to complete their life cycles. And if you look at this, you can see that some places down here in the Gulf, for example, Gulf of Carpentaria, are absolute hotspots in terms of migratory fish species. So which river systems are going to be most impacted by putting a dam in that might stop fish moving upstream and downstream? These ones. Where are we talking about putting dams in at the moment? I think many of you are probably aware in Queensland there's a lot of proposals that are talking about greater development in this area. Key to that development may well involve putting in dams. So again, you can look across the north and you can identify those river systems that are going to be hardest hit by developments which are going to stop fish movement and fish migration. <coughs> But what about the actual river flows themselves? What do we know about the amount of water that flows down in rivers and what does it mean for the fisheries? Well, I just want to give you a few bits of information that's come out recently which talks about the effects of river flows. So this is it data that looks at the amount of rainfall or the amount of flow coming out of rivers as a total annual flow and what that means for prawns, for mud crabs and for barramundi. So prawn catch, there's been long, as the uh, late 1990s, people have understood that there's a good relationship between the amount of flow that's coming out of rivers and the amount of catch of banana prawns. And this sort of data, all you need to know here is that as you're increasing, so as we get more and more of a flow coming out of the rivers, we're getting an increase in the numbers of banana prawns that are going into the commercial catch. This is from the Logan River in Queensland, but this sort of results have been repeated right across Northern Australia where you get more rivers, more flow coming out of rivers, you're going to get more banana prawns. Mud crabs, and this is results that's come been put together by the uh, entity of fisheries, and this is showing the same pattern. Mean wet season flow, as wet season flow increases, we're getting an increase in cat unit effort of mud crabs. Okay, so bigger flows, bigger floods, more mud crabs. Barramundis, this is work that's been based on fisheries data, commercial catches, and this is from the daily. But this same pattern is repeated across many river systems in Northern Australia. And it's the same pattern I've described already. Increases in wet season flows, you're getting an increase in catches. And in all of these cases, about somewhere between 30% to 50% of the differences, year to year differences in the catches is explained just by the amount of rainfall. Now, you are all acutely aware of that fact because you know that if we have a bad wet season, it's gonna be a bad year for fishing. Okay, but there's a lot of data that shows that this is the case for commercial catches, for recreational catches, for pretty much all the things that you're interested in catching in river systems. Why do we get those differences? Okay, part of it is catchability. So the fact that banana prawns, the reason they get good commercial catches of banana prawns in big wet season years is because the prawns have to have a certain amount of salinity, they have to have a certain amount of salt. The big freshwater pushes them further out, they move out into the salt water to get away from the water that's too fresh, and that brings them into the deeper water where they're easier to catch. So the banana prawns, part of the story is about catchability. Barramundi, again, you know, they're moving, um, there's a lot of evidence that they're more active and they're moving more around 
during those wet years, so it's catchability. But there's other factors that we're also getting a grip of. And some of the work that again involved um, Queensland fisheries and NT fisheries were very important in this work as well, has shown some other patterns. And this is year class variation. So this is the success of spawning and the survival of juvenile fish coming into the fishery. And you can see here year class survival goes up and down over this period, but here's the rainfall records. And you can see a pretty compelling case that in increased wet seasons, you're getting increased recruitment of juvenile fish moving into the fishery. There's also good evidence of a two year, three year lag where you're talking about the bigger fish then coming into the fishery as well. So there's instant effects, which are catchability and recruitment, and then there's lag effects, which are the bigger fish moving into the fishery as they become a catchable size. But any way you look at it, rainfall and river flows are critical in sustaining those fisheries. This is some work that we've done in the last couple of years in the Mitchell River in North Queensland, but we've got similar evidence for the Daly and other river systems. And what it shows is that we can go and look at where the barramundi and other fish are feeding, and we can identify whether the meat on those fish when you catch them has been grown in the river, on the floodplain, or in the estuary. And if we, we, we did this in the Mitchell River, the Mitchell River only has water on the floodplain for about six weeks to two months of the year. So it's a very short period when things are out on the floodplains. If you go out and you catch the small barra on those floodplains, the barra have moved, these are juvenile barra that have been in the estuary for most of their life, they've moved out onto the floodplains. Within six weeks, 70% of the meat on those barra has been grown in that six to eight week period that they're on the floodplains. This data comes from the commercial and recreationally caught barra, so these are bigger than 55 centimetre, and this is during the dry season. This might be 100 kilometres upstream, 70 kilometres downstream from the floodplains, and it might be six months after the floodplains are dried up. And yet, still, 35, 40% of the flesh on those barramundi is come from that floodplain. Okay, so you think about it in terms of fillets, that's like every second or third bite is you're eating floodplain production. Okay, despite the fact that it may have been caught a long way from it and months and months afterwards. So what it's saying is that that period on the floodplains is absolutely critical for that barramundi fishery. But it's also saying to me that the, being, the barramundi being able to move from the river to the floodplains and the estuaries, having river systems that are connected with those different parts of the river system is absolutely crit critical for the health and survival of that fishery. So what does this mean in terms of water? <coughs> Well, I've talked a lot about wet season flows and wet season floods, so what does it mean in terms of wet season water use? Well, if you look at another data set, and this is a study that was done by ERIS, so a Commonwealth Government Agency, drawing on data that was connected, collected from the commercial and recreational catches from the Daly River. This stuff hasn't been published in the scientific literature yet. There's a report out, but it hasn't been published in the literature, so it's not quite as strong the confidence we've got in this stuff, but it's still pretty convincing. What it shows is that the results from the classic uh, between 85 and 2005, again, there's this really strong relationship between wet season flow and the catch to the fishery. And the differences between good wets and bad wets explains about half of the variation in catches. Now, if you look at that, basically it's saying that as you get more and more water coming out, you get more and more fish. And so you can use that to predict what would happen if you took less and less, if you took more and more water out of the system, what effect would that have on the population of the fish in that river system? And this is the plot. There's some variation in this. There's some uncertainty around this because we, don't, we can't predict these things accurately 100%. It's a model. So it's just a, a, an estimate and it becomes much more uncertain as we're talking about increased extractions because up here, you're looking at the variation that might be within the natural occurrence, you know, 10 year, 20%, 10%, 20% changes in flow occur naturally. As you get down to some of these bigger changes, it's much harder to get data on those bit more extreme events. But what it's showing here is that a 20% reduction in wet season flows equates to something like a 20%, um, 26% reduction in the population of the fish. And in fact, the result from that shows that about a 20% reduction in flow equates to something like 30% decrease in the population. Now you all know that a 30% decrease in the population actually equates to something like a 70% reduction in the recreational catch. You know, as the population of fish decreases, you're not catching all the fish, but you get a small proportion of them. So it actually has pretty significant impacts. This study also did some work saying, well, what if you took 50% of the wet season flows out 
that results in something like a 62% reduction in the barramundi population, which equates to something like a 95% decrease in the likely catch by recreational fishermen. And they're pretty frightening figures. We don't have 100% certainty around those estimates, but it still shows you that if you take that linear relationship, you assume that every drop of water means more fish, then that's the sort of predictions for what happens if you take water out of the system. One of the other things that's just coming to light at the moment is some work that a PhD student of ours, Peter Novak, is doing at the moment on um, cherubin. He's found that cherubin breed, they lay their eggs, and then they have the eggs result in these little larvae that drift downstream. They've got to get to the estuary, they've got to get to salt water, so that then they can grow up and come back upstream as adults. Okay, so when the wet season starts, they start dropping these larvae. And the thing is, they do it all along the river system from Catherine all the way down, as soon as you get start getting some wet season flows, the cherubins start reproducing, these larvae drift down. The larvae have to get to the estuary within six days, otherwise they die. So he's been putting these larvae in fresh water in an experiment to see how long they can last for. So you've got six days. Now at the moment, the river flows up around Catherine. In a big wet season, there's no problems. They'll get down to the estuary within six days. But if you put a dam in, or if you take out the water in that wet season, That'll slow down the trap, the passage of time. That'll reduce the amount of time, increase the amount of time it's going to take those larvae to get downstream, and you're going to result in a reduction in the number of little little cherubin surviving. So it's going to affect the cherubin catches as well. What about dry season? Okay, there's been a bit more emphasis in understanding what happened with dry season because that's what the proposals are for water allocation at the moment. Nobody's talking about wet season in the daily, but they have been for the dry season for quite some time. One of the things that we did, again, joint with fisheries and Department of Land Resource Management, was look at all the freshwater fish in the daily, and then based on how they feed, how they breed, and where they move, which ones are most going to be affected by changes in dry season flows. And for the first time, you can come up with a, a relative assessment of their risk. And there's some species up here which are at a pretty high level of risk of changes in dry season flows. Some species down here that are found around the estuary or they don't rely on being migratory or whatever, it's less of a risk for them. But we know now that some species are really going to be affected by that more than others. And that includes things like black brim, uh, sui grunter, as well as barramundi. This is important on its own because it means if you're going to set up a monitoring program, you want to make sure you're monitoring these species up here because they're the ones that are going to be most affected by the changes in flows. Now in 2009, there were some predictions that were put out by the NT Gov around water allocation, what it would mean, and how those scenarios would affect water levels throughout the Daly River. We did some modelling on that, and the changes, the effects on barramundi and black brim at Galloping Jacks were pretty pronounced. So they've since changed those, because in 2011 they announced some different allocations, but this time there were a set of rules around those. You know, you couldn't take, uh, the water could only be taken depending on what the previous year's flow was, and there was a complex set of requirements which put into place a lot of restrictions on water harvesting within the river system. I haven't looked at the, the changes more recently, but our analysis of 2011 showed that at Galloping Jacks, the proposals that were put forward around these announced allocations would result at Galloping Jacks a reduction in dry season flows of something around 17% at Wilden, about 15% at Galloping Jacks, and then because the daily you know, there's more and more water comes in through the groundwater as it goes further downstream. So removal up around the top part, you, you don't notice it as much as you move further downstream. So what does this mean for the fish? Well, we looked at developing a model of changes in the population sizes and the abundance of black brim and barramundi, because they were two of the most hardest hit by dry season changes and flows. And if you look at black brim, this is what you would expect in the natural situation, and this is the probability of extremely low catches. So what's the chances of having a year where you get very low catches of black brim? On a natural flow, it's about 25%. You know, one in four years are pretty bad for black brim. If you take that water out under those allocations, it goes up to about 30%. You know, that's, that's not huge, but it's measurable. If you take the water out, that allocation, uh, early in the year, it makes no difference. Take it out late in the year, it makes no difference, okay? If you look at barramundi, again, you've got about a 35% chance of getting extremely low catches under a natural scenario. If you take those water out, all the water that's been allocated, if they actually used all that water, that would go up to about 40%. But if you take all that water out late in the dry season, so if they're allowed to take that water out late in the dry season, 
the risk to the barramundi does increase a bit at galloping jacks. Okay, so that's important to note, that different fish species respond differently to that timing. If you look at those impacts as you move further downstream, the differences actually get less and less as you move downstream, just because the effects of taking water out up in the catchment timber aquifer are, are mitigated as you move further downstream because you get more groundwater coming in as you move further downstream. But nonetheless, there are impacts there. Are those acceptable impacts? I'm not in the business of deciding that, you know, but there are measurable impacts and just letting you know about it. So that really brings us to the, the way that we make water allocation decisions in the NT. And broadly, you hear a lot of talk about the 80-20 rule. And people say that's 80%, it, it is. It's talking about 80% of water for the environment, 20% for other uses. Now, when you hear about the Murray-Darling Basin, you know, the reality is the situation is probably around the other way. They've probably only got you know, they're struggling to get 20% of the water for the environment and 80% is going for other systems. So on the face of it, you think we're doing pretty well up here with 80-20. But I'd also argue that we have much higher expectations about what we want and the quality of river systems up here than they do down in the Murray-Darling Basin. And so is 80-20 good enough? Well, I think it's, you'd want to proceed with caution given that we've shown that wet season flows can be an impact, dry season flows can have an impact, we've got to be cautious. We've established now with a lot of this science that more water equals more fish, but the relationship we now need to look at is how much water is required to maintain all the fish, basically. And when you take some of that water out, can you take some of the water out with no impact? And how far can you push it before you start having an impact? If you think, just say, this is hypothetical, if you just think about habitat, for example, it might be, and this would be a developer's dream, is that, you start getting more and more water in the river system and then up to say 70 percent all the fish habitat is now fully wetted the fish are happy you get 100 percent of your fish populations at 70 percent of your river flows and then there's all this extra water that's going out into the sea which effectively doesn't contribute to increases in fish populations if that was the case then under an 80 20 rule you could take out 20 percent of the water and you're still going to have 100 percent of your fish and if that was the case, it would be fine. There would be no problems with that. Most of the data so far has been where people have modelled these effects. They've assumed that it's probably a linear relationship. They've assumed that every drop of water contributes in some small way to increasing the fish populations. And then by the time you get to 100% of river flows, that's when you can support 100% of your fish. In that scenario, if you put an 80-20 rule in, then you get something a bit like what we showed with the daily before, you know, that if you take out 20% of your wet season flows, then you're going to lose something like 20% of your fish. What's, what's often happened in fisheries is that people talk about threshold effects. And we know that in the way that systems operate, it's very often, it's not just more water equals more fish, and, and, and every little bit more water equals more fish. Often what happens is, and, and this is just, again, hypothetical, but you can imagine a situation in a river system up north where there's not many fish when you've got no fish when you've got no water. As the river system starts to fill up and it reaches the, the full reach of the banks, then you get to say 50% of your fish. And then once you reach, the river starts to spill out over the banks and then it goes out on the floodplains, all of a sudden you get a massive increase in fish productivity. And you know, maybe that's what's happening. In these big wet season years, we get the water comes out on the floodplains and we get the really big pulses of fish populations. Now in that case, this is what we call a threshold. You reach a certain level here, it plateaus out, all of a sudden you hit a threshold. If we've got a situation like that, then the 80-20 rule can mean, you know, if you're taking 10% out, you're still getting 100% of your fish, then you take out just another 10% and you drop right down to 50%. So understanding whether we've got those thresholds is absolutely critical for the future of understanding how we're going to manage these fisheries. So, just to sum up, we know from the science now that more water equals more fish, more crabs and more prawns, and probably more cherubim as well. But we're not sure whether 20% less water equals no reduction in fish, a 20% reduction in fish, or 50% reduction in fish. We're really not sure about that. The 80 20 rule at the moment, it seems reasonable compared with down south, but as I've said, I, I don't think any of us would have the same expectations for river health as we do down south. But what is an acceptable level of change? You know, would people be happy to say, if we take out that water, we can grow more mangoes, we can grow other businesses, we can have all sorts of other economic development, but the likelihood is that it's going to be a trade off. 
between water that's being used to grow fish and water that's being used to grow crops or something else. You know, we've got to understand that there's likely to be a trade-off, and if we understand what that trade-off is, then we're maybe we can get some agreement on water planning, which is inclusive and has input from other people, we can agree on what's an acceptable level of change. So I would say that water allocation planning at the moment should proceed pretty cautiously. 80-20 is a reasonable start, but we really need to do research to make sure that that sort of rule of thumb is actually underpinned by good science. And we also need good monitoring. Because the critical part of this and what's been shown internationally is that people come up with these rules to allocate water and fresh waters, but the bit that's missing in that management loop is going back and actually monitoring to see whether the changes had an impact and if they had an impact which is beyond an acceptable level of change, then you better go back and change the allocations. And the problem is, once you make those allocations, sometimes it's very hard to change those allocations and claw that water back. You've seen the people burning the basin plan in the Murray-Darling Basin when they talked about trying to put some more water back into the river to restore the health of that system. So we have to be very cautious because I think what we should be doing is making sure we don't overdo it and then have to struggle to try and get the water back in those river systems but with good evidence and good science, we can work out how much water we can take out of the river before we go beyond an acceptable level of change. So at the moment, we're doing work which is helping to inform that, and we've got a lot of proposals at the moment for joint research with NT Gov and the Commonwealth agencies, NT Fisheries and others, to try and get a much better understanding of those threshold effects in the wet season and in the dry season, because that's probably going to be the secret to getting a better understanding of the sustainability and the health of these fisheries. Thanks very much. Thanks very much. Michael? Thank you very much. Any questions? Yeah, what time's the barbecue, I think? Uh, the barbecue's about, just about now. Thank you very much for uh, your presentation. And, uh, oh, sorry. Just a quick one. Um, is the, uh, the change of um, calculation of the, uh, the aquifer, or oh, any aquifer, from um, 100 years uh, back to 40 years. Is that a sensible thing to do? Um, whether it's a sensible thing or not is a, pretty much a value judgment, but it certainly changes the picture a lot. So it means that we know that there's sort of decadal 20 year or so cycles of wet seasons and dry seasons, and we know that there are longer term trends. You know, we have wet phases and we have dry phases. The last few decades have been some of the wettest decades in recorded history. So if you just take into account the last few decades, then you are certainly biasing your estimates towards overestimates of how much water there is in those systems. Uh, history would say that at some point we'll go back through another dry phase, and so a cautious approach would try and probably take the longest data records we've got so that we can you know, make sure that there's a lot of buffering in the system. Did that answer your question? Um, did that make um, that decision then uh, a prudent decision or uh, is that a um, shoot from the hip job? That's probably more policy decision than I'd want to answer that. Uh, Steve Popple, here. <laughs> Steve, I haven't actually met you, but I understood that you were going to be here. But, I mean, to me, once we get into that decision, that's kind of a policy decision. And, and maybe there's a people here who's, I mean, Steve's only just taken over that role, but he has that um, the role in, in NT government. I don't know, would you want to comment on that or? Okay, <laughs> well, I mean, fair enough. So, I mean, you know, to me that's kind of a value decision as to whether that was a prudent one or not, but I mean, it's certainly the least risk decision would be to take the longest period, which includes the, the greater variety of um, wet seasons and dry seasons. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah,